So today I'm going to talk about uh, the, the first segment of uh, my series of talks on the new biopolitics of race. And, to, and this one, what I want to do is just lay out uh, some of the ways in which race is being recreated as a biological category in uh, genomic science and biomedical research and biotechnologies. And then tomorrow at the 4 p.m. lecture on why care, I want to talk more about why I think this development is extremely significant and extremely dangerous. So I hope many of you can come back tomorrow because that will really be the, you know, the punchline of uh, why I care so much about this topic. But hopefully if you can't come back tomorrow, you'll still be able to get some idea from my talk today about why uh, this is an important topic for all of us to be thinking about, paying attention to, and um, I would say getting active around. So in uh, September 2008, the New York Times, in its style section, reported on a spit party that was thrown by the direct-to-consumer uh, DNA testing company 23andMe. And uh, there were lots of celebrities there, and people were able to send in samples of uh, DNA by spitting into these vials and sending them into 23andMe for analysis. And uh, people from 23andMe, including its founder, were there to uh, explain the importance of genetic testing. And this couple joked to the New York Times reporter that they were engaged to be married, but they were going to wait for their test results to see whether or not they were genetically compatible. And I think it gives an idea of uh, how important DNA has become in popular culture uh, claim, with companies claiming to be able to tell us everything about ourselves through genetic testing and also claiming to be able to tell us how we should affiliate with other people on the basis of genetics as opposed to some of the other ways that people have gotten together. And in fact, uh, the founder, Ann Wojcicki, uh, made this point that genetic testing was cr and the results from it uh, are creating a new kind of community where people will come together around their specific genotypes as opposed to nation and race. Uh, and this is a, a, a popular claim that the more we know about our genes, the less important race will become. That was, in a way, a theme that President Clinton echoed, or well, actually, he said it before, <laughs> that prior claim, uh, but part of uh, what he said when a draft of the Human Genome Project map was unveiled in 2000, that uh, one thing it revealed was that, in genetic terms, all human beings, regardless of race, are more than 99.9% .9 the same. And even though that statistic has changed a bit with more information, it's a little bit less the same than that, uh, the idea is that all human beings are remarkably the same at the genetic level, and race doesn't really matter once you know that. Uh, that was echoed, that idea that the map, the full sequencing of the human genome showed that race doesn't matter at the genetic level was echoed by Francis Collins, who directed the federal government's uh, human genome project, and Craig Venter, who directed a private uh, effort to map the human genome. So all three of them made the point of emphasizing that what they learned from the map of the human genome, part of what they learned, an important part of what they learned, was that uh, race does not exist in our genes. <coughs> uh, that was an important point because it confirmed for many people what 
evolutionary biologists, geneticists, sociologists, anthropologists, and others, uh, historians had <coughs> shown about race that the idea that human beings are divided into natural racial groupings is a myth that was invented uh, and that race is not natural. So of course it's not, can't be found in our genes. It's an invented political system. And so it seemed as if science was moving toward refuting, you know, definitively refuting the myth of biological races. Uh, a myth that had, in fact, been promoted for centuries by scientists. Uh, in fact, scientists were instrumental in the creation of the myth that human beings are uh, divided naturally into races. Uh, in creating it, in justifying it, in finding methods to prove it. Uh, we know that European naturalists created these typologies not because there was evidence of human races, but because it justified the efforts of Europeans to conquer, enslave, and colonize uh, people of color. And as a result of racism, race was created. Uh, I, I like a point that um, Paul Gilroy makes, and he makes it in much more fancy language, but <laughs> the language, the way I like to say it is, that race doesn't cause racism, it's racism that creates race. It's the first racism, but then you have to invent race to support the desire for some people to enslave and conquer and dominate other people. That's the only reason to divide human beings into races. So it seemed as if then, in June of 2000, that Science was going to take a different turn, and uh, <clears throat> there would no longer be this reliance on racial categories in scientific research, or racial categories as bio natural biological categories in scientific research. If race were going to be used in scientific research, it would be to understand racism. but. Now that the Human Genome Project showed that race is not a biological category, it wouldn't be used in that way in scientific research. And it seemed as if genomic and genetic scientists would start a new project of understanding human genetic diversity that wasn't chained to this old, antiquated myth that human beings are naturally divided into races. So there would be a new genomic science. Uh, you know, maybe scientists would look at something like, how do genes work in human bodies? Instead of looking at how do genes work differently in black bodies than white bodies, than Asian bodies, than Native American bodies. And many people were really hopeful. But then I open the New York Times a year later and see this headline, for, hum for genome mappers, the tricky terrain of race requires some careful navigating. <coughs> and Nicholas Wade, in describing the next phase of the Human Genome Project, instead of saying, scientists are now going to figure out how to study human beings without dividing them into natural human races, he says just the opposite, that the next phase of the Human Genome Project is going to involve the genetic differences between human races. That's, that's what is going to be the main focus, he says, of the Human Genome Project, just the opposite of what many people thought it would be. <clears throat> and of course, he's 
not representative of all scientists working in the world. There are those who would take issue with him, of course. But he's describing what he thinks is going to be a significant part of genomic and genetic research going forward. And he's saying this in a very influential newspaper that's supposed to report the truth. And he's saying it as if it's just a conclusive fact that human beings are divided up into natural, principal human races, and that there are genetic differences between them. The controversy, that why it's treacherous to him, isn't because there aren't really principal human races in the human species. It's just politically controversial because many people don't want to face the fact, according to Wei, that human beings are divided into these natural groupings. But he's not contesting that this is what scientists should be studying and that there is such a thing as the natural division of the human species into principal human races. So uh, there was that article and lots more and lectures I started going to and started to read the articles that followed the kind of path that Wade was talking about and became first kind of confused <laughs> about how it could be that this was an area of research that scientists were getting funded for, uh, that was getting lots of headlines in newspapers like the New York Times. Uh, even lectures where people who said that race was a political category, a political system of classifying human beings and that it couldn't be found at the genetic level, that, I, I was going to lectures where that was challenged and even seen as a flawed view that didn't want to face the current scientific evidence. So I was really dumbfounded by this at first and wanted to explore more. And the more and more I looked into it, the more I saw that there were not only these reports of the New York Times, but a whole slew of scientific articles based on an assumption of principal human races, uh, that the social categories actually mapped onto genetically determined categories, uh, and that there was also uh, new technologies that were being created and marketed based on this myth of biological human races. So I uh, started working on a book project, to, as Jane said, it was published in uh, 2011. And in the book, I argue that we're witnessing a new biopolitics of race, which has three main components. Uh, and the first two are what I want to talk about today. The uh, third is, will be uh, main part of my lecture tomorrow. And scientists are redefining race as a biological category written in our genes, or maybe more accurately to say, resuscitating <laughs> the idea that race is a biological category, but refurbishing it with new uh, genetic information and technologies. Uh, biotechnology and, pharm and pharmaceutical uh, industries are converting the new racial science into race-specific products. And significantly, all of this is going on at a time when racial inequality persists, you know, racial social inequality persists in the United States 
in a supposedly post-racial society. And I'll argue tomorrow that one of the reasons I think that this redefinition of race as a genetic category is so popular is because it provides an explanation for how it could possibly be that we see so much racial inequality, in fact, increasing racial inequality in wealth, uh, well, incarceration, it's go, the inequality is going down a little bit, but it's so dramatic, you know, so astronomical, that even uh, decreasing by a few points still leaves a whole lot of inequity in our criminal justice system, uh, in health inequities, uh, and on and on and on. The gaps are stable or getting worse. And uh, that's happening when many people believe that we're in a post-racial society where racism doesn't matter anymore. And so, as has always been the case, a biological definition of race provides an explanation, an excuse, a rationale for social inequality on the basis of race. I think, though, that today it's even worse because you know, in the past, during the eugenics era, for example, people said, we believe that the reason for inequities in society are because of genetic difference. These people said that. Today, it's more implied. <laughs> so uh, it's harder, I think, to challenge in a way <laughs> than to challenge what we now see as backward eugenic ideas. They don't seem so backward in the context of uh, new genetic information. Uh, so let me uh, show you some of the ways in which race is being defined as a natural genetic category. And for one thing, there in, in many, many articles, there is a definition of race given. Well, I should say many articles, there's no definition of race given. It's just used as, you know, if, and we should all know, you know, what race is and it's biological. I'll talk about that tomorrow. But in many, it, there is an effort to define race as a genetic category with the theory that race is developed as, uh, as in response to evolutionary pressures. So uh, that's literally what this article in Pharmacogenomics Journal uh, said, but I've, this definition you'll see lots of places. Races are population clusters based on genetic differences due to evolutionary pressures. And that idea that uh, what we think about as races, you know, have black, white, Asian, Native American, um, some would include Hispanic or Latino, that, uh, that they developed as identifiable, bi you know, biologically distinct groups as a result of evolutionary pressures uh, is a basis for a number of, a whole slew of studies, many of which get a lot of attention in newspapers like the New York Times. So let me just point one out to you uh, that was uh, on the front page of the Science Times, uh, took up half the page with this uh, etching of uh, enslaved uh, African people working uh, in, in, in a Georgia plantation, and the caption was, Harsh New World, Slaves in Georgia, around 1850, a new environment apparently brought genetic change. And uh, the Nicholas Wade reports on a study that and he describes it as concluding that certain disease-causing variant genes became more common in African Americans after their ancestors reached American shores perhaps because they conferred greater offsetting benefits. So this was a study that was trying to explain why African Americans have higher rates of cardiovascular disease and certain cancers, not only than whites, but also 
people in Africa. <laughs> and so, uh, which has been that that finding, for example, that Nigerians have lower rates of higher pretension than white people in America has been a problem for people who think that there's an African gene for hypertension. So one way that how do you get around, how do you, you want to insist that the reason why black people in America have high rates of hypertension because of some genetic predisposition, you have to come up with a theory of how African Americans are genetically different from Africans. Well, this is the theory, that after Africans were brought in chains to the United States, Apparently to the United States only because they then would have to explain why Jamaicans have lower rates of <laughs> hypertension, but that, we'll leave that aside. But it came to the United States. Uh, the, the gene pool changed as a result of adaptation to the conditions of the New World. And maybe there's some evolutionary biologists in the room who could, this just contradicts what I learned in biology, that it would take longer than that, right, for there to be this dramatic change that affects rates of cardiovascular disease and cancer. But the other, also that you would want to explain better what could be the benefit to a whole large group of people of becoming prone to disease, you know, <laughs> deathly disease. That's because natural selection is supposed to improve, right, your health, not make it worse. Uh, and then um, the other thing I would want to explain is why it is that those Europeans up there, the people that came from England and uh, Northern Europe, why didn't they have an even more extreme genetic change because weren't the conditions, you know, the, the environmental conditions harsher for them than for people who are coming from West Africa? You know, Georgia must have been a real shock, right, to someone <laughs> coming from London. So, but none of that is explained, uh, either in the original uh, scientific study or in Nicholas Wade's article, and what you get from this, though, is confirmation for people who believe that black people are genetically distinct, or African Americans are genetically distinct from uh, white people, Asians, Native Americans, etc., and that is the explanation for health disparities. This seems to uh, ratify that belief. Uh, just one more example from Nicholas Way, the, this, uh, another article that again conf conflates uh, social groupings and genetic groupings and provides an evolutionary explanation for racial difference, uh, reporting on a study that found a relatively distinct mutation in some East Asians. Uh, Wade reports that researchers have identified a mutation in a critical human gene as the source of several distinctive traits that make East Asians different from other races. Uh, actually, the, the study he's reporting on did not use the word race. Uh, but Wade interprets it as showing why it is that East Asians are a different race than other races of human beings. Again, confirming for many people the idea that there are genetic distinctions that separate people of different races and that they can be identified with a genetic test. So uh, that's a taste of some of the scientific research and the way it's being reported. Of course, there's a whole lot more, but I want to give an overview of the components of this new biopolitics bio of race. The next component is uh, the biotechnologies 
that are based on an assumption that the human species is divided into genetically distinct races. And uh, the drug that uh, the FDA approved in 2005, uh, a drug called Bidil, to treat heart failure in African American or black patients, self-identified African American or black patients, uh, is an example of what we may see coming down the road uh, in terms of race-specific medicine. Uh, although this drug was approved as a therapy for a specific race, it was not developed for any particular race. There was nothing about the formulation of it that had anything to do with race. Uh, it was, and it also didn't have any genetic research uh, involved in the development of this drug. This was simply a combination of two drugs that dilate the blood vessels and help patients with heart failure um, help their hearts beat more easily but the, because the blood vessels are dilated. So it relieves pressure on the heart, giving them a better chance of survival. A combination of two generic drugs that have been prescribed for more than a decade prior to the cardiologist uh, at, in Minnesota figuring out how to put them into one drug. And he did not develop this drug for black patients. He developed it for any patient who could benefit from having their blood vessels dilated. And uh, he didn't do any genetic testing. He wasn't a geneticist. He didn't work with any geneticists. It had nothing to do with any information about how anybody was genetically different and therefore uh, would benefit from this drug. And uh, the main reason why the drug became a race-specific drug was because after he patented it without any mention of race whatsoever in the patent uh, or in his application to the Food and Drug Administration to market the drug, the Food and Drug Administration uh, turned down his application because he hadn't conducted a clinical trial to test this particular drug. There was some old uh, research done by this researcher in connection with the Veterans Administration, uh, but it didn't, it wasn't good enough to get this drug approved. And so then he had the problem that his patent was going to run out. He needed a new patent. To get a new patent, he needed a novel claim. And so the novel claim that he added without changing the formula whatsoever to this drug was that it was a drug for African-American patients. The FDA allowed him to conduct a trial including only African-American research subjects. It worked. <laughs> there was a substantial reduction in death or you know, increase in survival, and then the FDA approved it as a drug for black people on the theory that he proved it worked for black people so that it could, had to be marketed to black people. Um, now, after there was a commercial advantage to marketing it that way, the company that manufactured the drug came up with a theory of why the drug should be marketed to black people. And it was that there is something different about heart failure in black people than in other people. Uh, that it's due in part why this worked so well in black patients due to ethnic differences in the underlying pathophysiology of heart failure. Uh, then later on down the road, it became more of a genetic explanation than just ethnic differences. It was a genetic difference 
that made this drug work so well in black people. And as the chair of the FDA advisory committee said, that approved, that voted to approve Vital as a drug for African Americans, we're using self-identified race as a surrogate for genetic markers. The idea that race can be used as a proxy for genetic difference. Instead of testing individuals' genetic makeup to see if a particular drug would work for them, if you know, scientists are able to come up with a link between, and they have for some drugs, the efficacy of a particular drug and uh, genes, well, instead of testing for the genes, you can use race, the patient's race, as a good enough surrogate or proxy for what their genes are. Uh, this theory has been used also in marketing vitamins. Uh, this is a vitamin that was marketed online. Uh, and you know, it, it says, I don't know if you can read the print, the first genetically specific nutritional supplements made just for you. Again, this idea that if we know your race, we can figure out what your genes are and then give you the right vitamin. Just like Vidil, this vitamin and, you know, it has nothing to do with genes, but it's the the myth, what they're doing is playing on the myth that race is a genetic distinction and that we, the doctors, pharmaceutical companies can know enough about your genes that they know your race and therefore they can market based on race what's just right for you. Uh, the difference in these vitamins is the amount of vitamin D. And yes, there may be a connection between the amount of melanin in your skin and the amount of vitamin D that would be helpful to you, but that's not race either, because of course we know that people in different social groupings of race could be a wide variety of colors. So the idea that blacks are dark, whites are light, and Latinos are somewhere in between is, I guess, a proxy for skin color, but wouldn't it make more sense than to just look at how much vitamin D you need according to your skin color than according to your race? If that's the theory you want to use. It has nothing to do, though, with some genetic test that this advertisement implies, but it furthers this idea that races are divided by genes, and we can know your genes if we know your race. Uh, that vitamin company and the story of Vidal uh, shows, and Jonathan Kahn, a professor at Hamlin University, has uh, really developed a lot of research on this, uh, that race is being used strategically as a genetic category to obtain patent protection and drug approval. It's, a, it's beneficial, not scientifically, but commercially. That is what is driving a lot of uh, this development. Uh, this idea that race can be used as a proxy for genes and therefore medicines can be targeted by race and be precise enough to um, treat you according to your genes was emphasized when the FDA, in its press release, called Vidal a step toward the promise of personalized medicine. I, I just, I really think this is such <laughs> A travesty that a federal agency would say something like this, which is so untrue. Because in what with personalized medicine, uh, although you know it's got all sorts of new names now, it might be precision medicine, 
personalized might not be the right term anymore, but whatever it is, the idea is that doctors are going to be able to, this was the promise, fading quickly, but the promise was that doctors are going to be able to test or sequence, perhaps, your entire genome and be able to tell you what drugs you, know, you should get. And uh, how a race-based medicine can be a step toward that doesn't make sense unless, again, you believe that someone's race tells you what their genes are, which isn't true. So that, I think that's a false statement. But <laughs> FDA, again, emphasized it. Now, there are health inequities in this country that fall along racial lines. It is true that you can look at many, many, many diseases, illnesses, where people of color especially fare worse than white people in America. It's not true for all, but many. One example is breast cancer in Chicago. Uh, this study that was published in uh, 2007 found that even though in 1980 black and white women in Chicago had exactly the same rate of death from breast cancer, even though white women then and now have a higher incidence of breast cancer, black women 20 years later were twice as likely as white women to die from breast cancer. I think that is alarming. I think we should do research into why that is. But if you want to look for the black gene that causes black women to die, you would be going down the wrong path because you'd have to explain how that gene, unless we're going to have another one of these weird theories of evolution, that in 20 years, I don't think even Nicholas Wade would say that in 20 years, black women could have evolved to die at twice the rate of white women when they had the same rate. I mean, the only explanation for this is that it is, has something to do significantly, right, with environmental reasons. And the authors of the study concluded that the reason why this gap developed was because, and note, it's not that black women, that their death rate got higher, it's that white women's death rate was cut in half. And the most plausible explanation is that from 1980 to 2004, there were incredible improvements in the diagnosis and treatment of breast cancer. And white women had the advantage of those, and black women got absolutely no advantage from those improvements. That's something we should be alarmed about. I think we should also be alarmed that instead of addressing that inequity, our government is spending, and private investors also, lots and lots of money looking for the genetic reason why, which doesn't, I would argue, make sense. Just wanted to point out that the CDC also in November 2012 found very similar statistics for, um, uh, on a national level. Now, Lest you should think that I, don't, I think genetic testing is useless or that I don't think there's good things to be learned from genetic research, I, I, that's far from the truth. I think that, as I said, it would be terrific to learn more about how genes work in human bodies, how genes work in cancer tumors, how genes work in uh, people with asthma, you know, all sorts of illnesses, to learn more about that, uh, to help human beings prevent and treat illness, I think would be great. And one example of that is this uh, test, the Oncotype DX test, that tests the tumor uh, in women with breast cancer and is able to predict whether or not the patient would benefit from chemotherapy. It's able then to avoid 
harmful chemotherapy in women with breast cancer who don't need it. I think this, I happen to have a friend who was able to just undergo radiation for breast cancer, was cured without chemotherapy, without the test, she might have undergone potentially damaging chemotherapy. Great discovery, great tool, but it doesn't matter what race you are, what, it ma what matters is the genetics of your tumor. In fact, there's evidence that treating women with breast cancer on the basis of race can actually harm certain women. An example is the very common myth that only Ashkenazi Jewish women can have the BRCA1 or 2 mutation. That is simply not true. But it seems to have led some doctors not to counsel African American women about, or to direct them to counseling for BRCA1 and 2. Um, for the BRCA1 and 2 mutations. A, a, a study conducted by Katrina Armstrong and others at Penn found that African American women were far less likely than white women. In fact, white women were four times as likely to get counsel for BRCA1 and 2. Uh, even when the black women were clinically at risk. So the clinical indicators should have directed them to this counseling, but something was preventing doctors from doing it. I think it is this idea. I mean, it could be a lot, it could be they didn't think that, that maybe there wasn't insurance for it. It could be lots of things, but I think one plausible explanation is that doctors who typically treat patients based on race, they're taught to do it in medical school, are taught that it's Ashkenazi Jewish women you need to send to counseling for BRCA1 and 2. Black women couldn't be Ashkenazi Jewish women, even though, of course, that's not true either. <laughs> you know, but uh, these racial categories and myths about them affect medical decision making. Okay. When was I supposed to stop? <laughs> Already? <laughs> well, it's up to you. I mean, we, we usually go till 5.30, including okay. the Q&A. Okay. So, yeah. Okay, so if I stop, like, in 10 minutes or so, there'll be time, right, for Q&A? Yeah. Okay. All right. I, I just want to touch on um, another technology, well, a couple other technologies. Again, just to give you an idea of how pervasive this idea of race as a genetic category is in technology as well as research. And another area is reproductive medicine. Um, now, by and large, images and marketing of reproductive uh, technologies, high-tech reproduction assisting technologies, involve white people. Uh, when I wrote my book, Killing the Black Body, back in 1997, all I could find, <laughs> and I, I studied, I wrote, I had a chapter on the new reproduction, and I studied images of uh, in vitro fertilization, other high-tech reproduction assisting technologies, and all of them involved white people. You, just, you could not find a picture promoting uh, fertility with a black person in it which made sense because most of the what we heard in the media was that black women had too many babies even though black women have higher rates of infertility than white women in the united states but the image of what the product of these technologies what not just these technologies but anything involving genetics what is the positive product to promote this it's always images of almost always images of, of white people. And uh, this particular uh, fertility clinic, when you go online, these, are, these pictures are actually streaming. <laughs> so you see lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of pictures of white babies. I just think, I mean, just, just think about it if you could imagine a commercial for in vitro fertilization with streaming images of black babies. I, you just, I can't imagine it in America. 
and I haven't seen it either. I've looked at lots and lots and lots of these. But, well, also in the popular media, as well, when there are movies about, you know, futuristic movies about technologies that create genetic perfection, they tend to have white stars. Of course, most movies in America have white stars, but, but, they, but they usually have blonde hair and blue eyes. You know, Scarlett Johansson and Uma Thurman who are the stars in these movies. A very uh, racialized promotion of genetic enhancing or reproduction enhancing technologies. Now, when I did my research for Fail Invention 10 years later, I noticed that there was, or is it 20 years later? I can't figure it out. Anyway, I don't want to think about it. Um, I noticed that there was uh, a change with more and more marketing to people of color. But it still shows that the marketing of eggs and sperm is very much based on racial categories. And in fact, if you know, these are some advertisements on Craigslist, all ethnicities welcome, but Asian donors are especially needed. Egg donors wanted all ethnic backgrounds. We have a very high demand for Jewish, East Asian, Middle Eastern, Asian, Italian, and blonde donors. Um, uh, the, if you go to sperm banks or egg banks, uh, to what, you, know, you can shop for them online, you actually can shop by race. You know, that's how everything is categorized. And of course, that's how most people, that's the most important thing to people, the, the race of the egg donor, sperm donor. Uh, well, this particular fertility doctor doesn't leave it to chance what you might get if you pick a sperm donor or egg donor. You know, people think that just because you know what the sperm donor egg donor looks like or acts like or how smart they are that the children are going to be just like that. But, you know, that's not true. And if you all believe that, it's not true. Genes do not determine everything. Heredity does not determine everything. So if you want to be more sure of it, then what you can do is create embryos and Dr. Jeffrey Steinberg will test the embryos to pick the ones that are most likely to produce the child you want with the gender, eye color, hair color, and even complexion of the child that you want. Uh, in also in pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, much more common than choosing gender and hair color and complexion, is choosing the chromosomal fitness of the child and uh, the child to be born from the embryo. And race is commonly one of the factors that companies look at in determining risk for Down syndrome and other uh, so-called chromosome problems. Again, this is based on the idea that your race can tell what your genes are and can predict then, well, it's used in the prediction, the calculation of risk. I'll just tell a little side story. I never thought that I would I never tested an embryo, one of my embryos for genetic, its genetic makeup, but I did participate unexpectedly in a study that was testing uh, maternal blood uh, for and using an ultrasound to see if it could predict Down syndrome in the first trimester. Uh, when I was pregnant, uh, I was pregnant with my fourth child at age 44, so I was considered high maternal risk. And uh, my obstetrician 
wanted me to get an ultrasound and I guess I wasn't paying attention. The ultrasound was in connection with a research study that Northwestern University was doing at the time I was teaching at Northwestern. And it was to determine whether it was possible. Now this, this test is actually now performed routinely on women in the first trimester of pregnancy. Uh, but this was the research to see whether or not they could determine accurately enough a risk of Down syndrome. You know, of course, they just give you a number. You don't know what that means of, for your risk. But, um, well, I went in to get the ultrasound. So I get there and I find out I'm being enrolled in a clinical research study. So on the, the uh, checklist, they asked for my race. So I said, well, why do you need to know my race? What does that have to do with whether or not either your research into whether you can tell in the first trimester whether a baby is, has a certain risk of, the fetus has a certain risk of Down syndrome, or telling me what my risk is? Well, they couldn't tell me. <laughs> And we just use race. I said, well, how do you want me to determine what my race is? Doesn't that make a difference? I, the research, I don't know. Just put down whatever you think your race is. I said, well, how, how could that? So if I, put, if I put down black, you're going to tell me one number. If I put down white, you're going to tell me a different number. If I put down Asian, it'll be a different number. You know, she got tired of my questions. But <laughs> I thought, this was way before I started working on this project, I thought, that just does, you know, I, that didn't make sense to me. It seems so scientifically invalid to ask somebody, what do you think your race is, and then put it into a precise calculation of that you're going to tell me about the risk that my child will have Down syndrome. You know, maybe if she had some logic for why race was important, I could have told her something more about how I determine what my race is, and then it would make sense. But this is very typical of how these things are done. Just put down whatever you want, and we're going to use it to come up with some precise genetic formulation. All right, last. Uh, uh, technology I, I want to tell you about is uh, ancestry testing. Uh, these are like 23andMe direct to consumer uh, companies or you know you could you might get some personal attention as well um, where uh, they claim that a genetic test can either tell you what race you are or what percentage of different races you are or uh, they might call it something else. They might call it your biogeographical ancestry, but biogeographical ancestry is defined as the genetic component of your race. So it is, you know, basically a racial definition or a particular tribe that um, you belong to. Uh, this is often marketed to African Americans to tell them what tribe in Africa they share a common ancestor with, although it's very commonly thought of as, we will tell you what tribe your ancestors came from. Uh, and uh, Jews, to tell them what of the 12 tribes of Israel they came from. Or Native Americans, to uh, tell them what tribe, uh, well, it's to authenticate either their Native American ancestry, that would be the racial test, or uh, their um, enrollment in a tribe. Oh, well, that's what I was saying. The term, this is how ancestry by DNA defines biogeographical ancestry, the biological or genetic component of race. Um, Alondra Nelson, a sociologist at Columbia, has pointed out that for African Americans, this is an important cultural practice that helps to resolve the injuries of the slave trade because uh, for African Americans, most cannot 
trace their ancestry to anywhere in Africa because the slave trade destroyed all of those, well, didn't create the records. And so um, it's just impossible to go that far back. Uh, and many see this as a way of uh, reconnecting with the African continent. Uh, but I argue that not only do these companies, they're not able to do what they claim they can do. Uh, you could just, you know, one simple way of contesting the idea that they can tell you what tribe you came from, or even if you share a common ancestor with a modern day tribe, is that if they haven't collected the DNA from that tribe that your ancestors came from or are related to, they can't compare your DNA to it. So they're going to tell you another one <laughs> that they do have in their data bank. And uh, that's just one of many problems. But a more fundamental problem to me is that it reinforces this idea that our citizenship, our identity, is rooted in genetic sameness and difference. So uh, I see in these developments in both uh, biomedical research and genomic research and in uh, biotechnology and pharmaceuticals and reproductive medicine a resurgence of the idea that human beings are naturally divided into biologically distinct big groupings that map onto you know, our everyday notions of race and that this is the explanation for health disparities, but as I'll talk more about tomorrow, other inequities in our society, and that the way to solve them is to look deeper into these genetic differences and address them with technological and pharmaceutical remedies. That's one path. But I advocate another path which recognizes the vast genetic diversity in the human species that cannot be and is not divided into races, but also recognizes our shared humanity that is tarnished and degraded and dehumanized by the notion of race, of biological race. And I argue that instead of going down that former path, we should affirm our shared humanity by working to end the social injustices that are preserved by the political system of race. So I'll end there for today, and I'm happy to take uh, questions and, and comments. Thank you. because I, yeah, I really think we need more people within reproductive medicine, genetics, you know, because they'll listen to you, they'll listen to well, me. I'm not sure they'll listen to me either, but it's been very interesting. I am a cell molecular biologist, yeah. but one of the things that's most frustrating for me is that the scientists that are appalling but fascinating about the whole vital story is that Jonathan Kahn has done a great job and they've talked about the ethical issues, yeah. the commerce issues, right. uh, the social issues and that, but nobody uh -huh. wrote a paper, which I'm trying to write, oh, good. saying uh -huh. that that science was invalid. Yeah. So when they said it, it was just a suggestion, yeah. you know, that there may be a pathological, a physiological right. difference. Right. I looked at the original papers on that, Yeah. and it was appalling because, and 
biology, but, but two of them were nothing more than blood pressure cuff studies. <laughs> right, right. And right. the third one, they thought that they were getting an issue because they actually collected cells at birth from the umbilical cord of the baby. Mm -hmm. And they put them in culture and they looked at nitric oxide, which actually right. affects the expansion of the blood vessel. Right, right. And what they did was they wrote the whole article, and the conclusions don't even matter because they were invalid. <laughs> Nowhere in the paper did they understand that those cells from the umbilical cord weren't maternal. <laughs> right, 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 right. So I'd love to talk to yeah. you because I'm trying to deconstruct yes. it in biological yes. terms to biology. Yes, yes, which I think is so important. At, at Penn, I'm working on putting together a program on race, science, and society that I want to be an interdisciplinary, you know, I call it a transdisciplinary program with life, you know, biological science, scientists and social scientists, because I think both have a lot to learn from each other. Uh, and I don't see this project moving forward without an integrated approach like that. Uh, because the, you know, many times the biological scientists will say, well, we're doing our research in the lab. We don't, we don't care about those social issues. They don't affect us. But they do affect you, and they do have an impact on society. And then the social scientists who aren't trained, most of us, in biology, uh, you know, aren't, don't seem credible. And also, I'm really interested in the potential for a science that doesn't rely on false notions of race. And you know, sometimes I've had, I can think of one conversation with a very renowned reproductive scientist you know, who's insisting to me he had to divide his research subjects by race. Race is important to every aspect of, all of his medicine. And he said, you know, I don't have anything else I can use but race. It's, it's all, it's the best we have, you know. I, and he, he said to me, tell me, what am I supposed to use besides race? I said, no, you should tell me. You are the reproductive scientist. You know, why don't you think, think about it? You're, it's a brilliant. I think you can come up with something besides what Linnaeus talked about, you know, several hundred years ago. But the, uh, one of the personal opinion, not yeah. popular probably, is yeah. NIH has done a tremendous amount to reinforce this. Yes. Because what happened is we had laws about, you know, to prevent, to check discrimination yes. in banking, discrimination yes. in housing, yes. discrimination in education. So we got in the habit of looking things by race and yes. ethnicity. Yes. And now, still, when you apply for an NIH grant, it wants to know the race and ethnicity yeah. of your population, yeah. even when you're not looking at social yeah. determinants. Yeah. And that reinforces the idea that race is violent. Yes, I, I agree. Again, that project to get NIH to change the guidelines exactly. is something that would have to involve the biomedical, you know, and other biological researchers who could say to NIH, again, I think that would be more effective than my saying it, you are forcing us to use race when it's not even relevant to our study. So again, I think an integrated approach, and I really, I would love to talk with you more. I'm glad that, that you're doing that research. Yeah. Um. True confessions time. I'm an <laughs> uh, anthropologist raised in the uh, Boazian yeah. field uh, tradition. Yeah. And uh, when Nicholas Wade, back around 2000, started uh, discovering the stains in the building on the papers that were, I think, in science, yeah. somehow, uh, it looks as so though we do have continental races, right. five races, right. and so on. Right. I wrote to him a number of times, and he wrote back in lovely letters, and I wrote long letters, uh, and he wrote back and asked nice questions, none of which made any sense at all. Yeah. I mean, made any difference right, at all right, as far as right, I'm concerned. But right. that's kind of my question here. When you talk to, it's not an easy concept to get across yeah. that race is a fallacious notion. Yeah. And I'm wondering, when you talk to, to, to groups, do you yeah. have the sense that they really understand? This, or might they also slip into yeah. the notion that, well, you could, still could. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
I get lots of different reactions. I'm sure there are lots of different reactions in the room. Um, it's, it's a challenge because, you know, if you, if you have an hour, it's very hard. You could spend, uh, you know, I'm teaching a whole course on race, science, and society where we spend the whole 12 weeks <laughs> just talking about the, the definition of race. And it's so easy, I think, this, this is something I, I discovered working on this book, that people think of the social construction of race as being consistent with a biological construction of race. They don't see it as two opposing ways of thinking about race. So in my mind, when I say race is socially constructed, I mean that all race is, is a social construction. It is an, the very idea of dividing the human species into large groups of distinctive people. You know, there has to be some distinction between each group, or it wouldn't be a race. There'd be no point in doing it. So the whole point is to take the human species and divide it up into groups that are different enough from each other for it to matter, right? Okay, that very practice is a political practice. It's an inventive practice. You know, why are you going to pick five groups? You know, even with the structure, um, the, the, the clustering studies you were talking about, you know, you, you have to tell the computer how many groups to divide the human species into, or the genetic, you know, the, it's not even the human species, it's the database they happen to have. So just that very idea that it's important important to divide the human species up in that way, the number of groups we're going to use. You know, why, you could look at the continent of Africa, the most genetically diverse place in the world. Why would you ever group all people in Africa into one race? That makes, it just scientifically makes no sense. You could, you could pick a hundred races for Africa. You could divide, say, people in Zimbabwe are as different from people in Ethiopia as people from Ethiopia are from people, you know, in Sweden. So why would you divide it up? That clearly, it's a political or cultural, a social decision to group all people of Africa and then anyone who has any African ancestry in the same group. I mean, sometimes I say to groups, this sometimes gets across to people. Right, in the United States, we think that anyone with any African ancestry is black. It would make just as much sense to say that anyone with any European ancestry is white. That makes just as much, it's just as scientifically valid. It makes just as much scientific sense. But pe most people think if you said anyone with any European ancestry is white, they would say, that, no, that's impossible. That doesn't make sense. You know, I'm white now. As probably every black person in this room is white now. But that they really are white. They really are white if that's the rule. It's the rule makes just as much sense as saying that everyone with any African ancestry is black. And I know a lot of people, they just can't wrap their minds around it. But Maybe if they think about it long enough, they'll see that the, that rule is just made up. And then you see, well, why was it made up that way? Well, it was made up that way because it benefited first white slaveholders and then people trying to hold on to white power in, in the Jim Crow war era. That was a better rule for them. <laughs> You know, and it, you could maintain a pure white race in that way. But, but I think what hinders a lot of people is that they're so used to dividing people up by race that it seems natural. It's hard to see that. Um, the other thing is that the idea that race is socially constructed means that People are divided, for many people, people are divided into biological races and what it means to be black or white or Asian, you know, in America is different in our society from in France, from in Brazil, from in South Africa. That's, so 
You know, they're natural divisions, but they're socially constructed in different ways. And so it's just a misinterpretation of what many, many of us met when we said race is socially constructed. That's why I now say race is, I don't know if it helps, I say race is a political system of governing people. Because race is socially constructed, people, it, it doesn't really get at the non biological, you know, naturalness of race. Um, so, but it, it's hard. The other thing is, you know, people, were, people are so invested in racial categories. You know, just that idea that it could be a rule that anyone with any European ancestry is white, that's very unsettling to many people. Because many people are very invested in being white meaning a certain thing and meaning that you have certain privileges and even if they don't are conscious of it, you know, you have certain positive assumptions about you that shouldn't, you know, that, that I shouldn't have. Because <laughs> I look too black, so it's not, I, I shouldn't be entitled to those assumptions. Only white people are entitled to those assumptions. And even, again, even if it's not conscious, but, you know, people of other races have the, the same thing. I mean, I found the resistance from black friends and colleagues also who believe that, you know, if, we, if it's not natural, blackness isn't natural, if it's not deeply embedded in us, how do we, what's our solidarity based on? You know, how do we distinguish our specialness from everybody else? So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I want to thank you for the wonderful presentation. I, I find yeah. this really fascinating and thank disturbing you. at the same time. And another uh, anthropologist uh, on this. Um, it just strikes me, this may be the really cynical view of this, mm -hmm. but you must have thought about this mm -hmm. idea before. There's just a lot more money in drawing lines than erasing them. Yes, yeah. So, I have to say, I haven't thought, I like that line that I borrowed. Sure. A, a I mean, lot more yeah. money in drawing lines than erasing them. Yeah, so the way I've thought about it is, which may get at the same, um, the same thought, is that what, you know, what I'm advocating here, this, this costs a lot socially. But it's not commercially um, profitable uh, in our the current you know our current system. I suppose we could figure out ways to make it commercially profitable to um, to change society to be, to be more equitable. Mm -hmm. But you know you take the example, let's say, of asthma. You know, there are researchers looking for the gene, the African gene, that explains why African American children have more severe forms of asthma and are more likely to die from asthma. Well, you can, if you find that gene, then maybe that could be the basis for a drug for black kids. But if instead you look at the mountain of evidence that shows that it's because of the environments that low-income and poor black children live in, there are lots of aspects of the environment. One is, you know, near highways where there's a lot of fuel, a car exhaust that makes asthma more severe. There's lots of other things too, you know, lack of access to regular health care and other many, many other things. Well, that that will cost a lot of taxpayer money to change, but you know, no business. It's not as easy to make a profit off of it, um, the way things are structured now. And uh, so I, th I think that you know, there's, a, there's, there's the political investment and there's also the commercial investment in keeping racial lines drawn. I mean, they may change, or the lines may change. I think political developments change exactly who belongs to what race? You know, we've seen this is another way that we know that race isn't natural because 
Again, you take any of these categories, say the category white, we know that who, who's considered white has changed so dramatically over, um, even within you know, the 20th century, I, I, we could see it changing. I mean, with the, the Boston bombing and the, the man who was uh, arrested, the young man who's arrested, I, you could just see in the discussions about he's from Chechnya, but he's a girl, you know, and people say, well, what race is a Chechnya, <laughs> you know, what Chechen? Maybe that's, I think they would be categorized as white. And it's interesting because someone said to me, I knew it wasn't a white person who did it. what do you mean? I think he is white. <laughs> but in their mind, you know, a foreign terrorist is not white. And so the, the lines may change, but there's still racial lines. In the back, I know you meant, yeah. Speaking of all the money, so was that pharmaceutical drug First time that a patent had been given that had the, the knowledge claim based on race. So that's one of the things that was most disturbing to me. And also the oh. FDA marketing. Yeah. You know, if you, if you talk about like herbal supplements, there's always that statement that said, this claim is not approved by the FDA, but it's right. like they did get yes. the FDA approval. And yes. That's you know, the, the right. I think the FDA approval, as I said, is just a travesty. There's so many aspects of the approval of Bidel. Um, partly during the hearing, they, the, the, Steve Nissen said, well, we don't have to use the same high standards we ordinarily use. This is like an orphan drug, you know, which is a drug that's developed for a, 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 an illness that only affects you know, a, a small, relatively small group of people. So I guess because it was for black people, he was analogizing it to an orphan drug, and therefore the standards could be lowered, for, you know, the standards of evidence could be lowered, in addition to the race as a proxy for genetics comment, and also that it's a step toward personalized medicine, you know, I could just go on and on and on with the problems, and I think the uh, cell biologist is going to find even more problems when we read her article. Um, so I, 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 I appalled that the FDA, the, the statements, the approval, the statements of why the after the fact attempt to make it seem as if there were a genetic explanation for it when that wasn't part of the research. Um, in terms of race-based patents, this is also referred to Jonathan Kahn. Uh, he's, uh, he has a book called Race in a Bottle that has some of this research, but also uh, several articles on patent law. And uh, he finds new patents every day, <laughs> uh, uh, race-based patents. I mean, he, he has an article that shows that in the last oh, 20 years or so, there was a five-fold increase in race-specific um, gene-related patent applications. He's also found a couple instances where patent officers required the applicant to add race to the claims on the grounds that the research was conducted on a particular racial group, or, you know, and so therefore the claim had to be based on race. Now, I believe in the cases he found that it was overturned by, on appeal, but he has found cases where patent officers have required race to be added to the claims. So there were race-specific patents filed before Biel and an increasing number since. And, and another point that he makes is that they're, they're, they, they seem to be added in many cases. Like there'll, there'll be a claim that you know, this device is for everybody, and then there's a, another claim it's for this smaller group, smaller group, smaller group, but you know, then a race-based claim. Um, and also, um, he's found that where there's absolutely no need, like there, a, a, a patent application for a genetic, a BRCA1 and 2 test for African American women. What? You know, why do you need it? <laughs> it's you test for the gene. Why do you need a special test for African American women? So, um, but lots of examples of that 
where race seems to just be added unnecessarily. And this is a point I make in Fatal Invention, he also makes in Race in a Bottle, that the, I'm gonna talk about this a little bit tomorrow too, the idea that the more we learn about genes, the less important race will be, you know, that just, just give us some time, we're using race for the time being, because we have nothing else to use, we can't do whole, you know, um, inexpensively enough, whole genome sequencing of every patient. So until that day comes, which is right around the corner, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> this right around the corner has been going on since 2000, you know, right around the corner, uh, everyone's whole genome is going to be sequenced and then the doctors will be able to prescribe just the right medication. But in the meantime, we're going to use race. But what both of us have found is that there are already instances where there's no need to use race, and yet it's used. So if it's commercially opportune, you know, profitable, if there is a popular investment in it, the one thing I argue in Fatal Invention is that it's as if there's a genetic claim made, but if you can say, and it's found in a particular race, especially, it seems to add, instead of making the claim seem less plausible, it seems to add to the plausibility of the claim. And, and you can really see this in, when, when Nicholas Wade publishes an article like the several I've shown you, and you read the comments, like the one, the article he wrote about East Asians, you know, the trait that makes them a different race, or different from other races, Read the comments, if you can, without, I mean, I just, I get, really, I get physically ill reading them, because people write in, you know, this confirms what I knew all along, you know, that, and, and just racist stuff, too, you know, about whatever particular race there's, a, a, has the, the latest claim about their genetic distinctiveness, comments will tend to say, well, that explains why they do X, Y, Z stereotype. So um, it, it, it's very sobering to read those, but you get the, you un understand, it's really, really uh, highlighted the way in which many people, and I know that's not, you know, not a uh, randomized sample of people <laughs> writing in. It may be the nuttiest people writing in, but it gives you an idea of what many people feel about, you know, so deeply about racial distinctiveness and how they so eagerly latch on to any evidence. Uh, and, and just one more thing, going back to what, uh, what's your name, the cell biologist? I'm sorry. Teresa as well. Okay, as Teresa, is that okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, yeah. Duol said, um, you can, you, you don't have to be a cell biologist to read some of these studies and find the flaws in them. I mean, I think it's much better for you to do it. You can find flaws that I, I couldn't find, but I can find a whole lot of flaws reading the studies. Unfortunately, people usually read the headlines and you know a little bit of the article and don't go back and read the study but you know the, the study for example that and I'm, I'm going to end after this the study for example that uh, made the claim that African Americans evolved since arriving on North American shores to be predisposed to cardiovascular disease and cancer um, you know I, I went back and re read the study and one thing I saw right away was that their comparison of Africans and African Americans was based on a sample of Nigerian, you know, Nigerians from one particular tribe. That stood in for all of Africa. And so I right away saw that, well, there's a big fly here. How can you say you make a claim about the difference between African Americans and all Africans based on a sample of DNA from one African tribe. I'm not going to rely on that study, <laughs> besides all the other obvious flaws in it. So um, I do re highly recommend to the students here, when you read these, these headlines, 
don't be afraid to look up the study. Ask the library to get it for you if you don't know how to find it. And read it and look and see. You know, did they have a big sample? Are they basing this on 23 African Americans and 50 white people? How did they determine who was black, who was white, who was Asian? You know, who was in the sample? How did they do the comparison? What was the point of the study? Do they define what they mean by race? You know, you, could, you can find, you don't have to believe <laughs> these studies. You can test them and criticize them. Uh, you're smart enough to do it, it you know, and you can, I, I, one thing I always say is I know more about race than many of the scientists who are using it in their studies and I can find flaws that they may not even be aware of uh, and again, I'll end it on a positive, so we need to work together, I think, to uh, move to a new way of thinking about human beings that's not shackled to this archaic notion of race. So, thank you.